So one of the things for a public institution such as mine is that, you know, I was talking about, you know, we've got Stuart Charter. So, you know, we are there to, um, you know, add to um, the long term viability of the organisation. It's not something that we can just take up the, shut the door and say, oh, look, actually it's not working, we'll go home. Um, we need to actually engage in the public good and tell people why it's good to come to a culture institution, that culture is good, and it's a great experience and how you can engage in that. Um, and we want to do that by achieving more visitors and people revisiting. So we need to change our exhibition programs. We need to change our programs. You know, we have a whole raft of um, public programs and education programs, and of course a whole raft of exhibitions that happen you know, four times a year in the large gallery and five or six times a year in the actual smaller gallery. But we actually change our collections all the time. All cultural institutions change what's actually on offer in the main galleries all the time. And there's a couple of reasons for that, and most of you would know that. One is about conservation of the object or the artwork, but the other is about giving somebody something new to see when they come back for that revisit. Um, so, brand loyalty and engagement ensures repeat visitor traffic to the institution. Um, I think that most people who come to the portrait gallery know what they're going to get, and um, and they're engaged by that. And when they come into that experience, I mean, the best experience I can have is actually to go down on the floor. You know, I sit in an office upstairs. You know, um, do a lot of strategic thinking. I only wish, you know, if I had time. Um, but when I get down on the floor, and I actually see how the visitors engage with what we do, um, the gallery is really welcoming, and I think that has a lot to do with the design and the light, so it just doesn't start about what's on the walls, it's about that whole experience when they walk in the door. You know, we have somebody there who opens the door for us. You know, it's kind of a luxury, but it works, and people actually feel really welcomed by that, so that first experience they get when they come to the portrait gallery is a welcoming experience. They walk through that beautiful hall, it's large, it's you know, filled with activity, people relaxing over one side, people there to help them. Um, and that is really about gaining that, that experience when they first walk in, it's about building that loyalty. Um, and there, it just says the destination experience creates the loyalty. And I just think that, um, I'm sure a lot of you have been to the Portrait Gallery. <coughs> Can I say to you that um, as much as I love the museum, I'm very passionate about the museum, and I was there for 10 years, and I had two roles at the museum. One was about marketing and the other one was commercial. So I went from being the marketing manager to the commercial manager there, So, which kind of says there's a shift in cultural institutions in itself. But people used to go to the museum and if you actually interviewed them and spoke to them a month after they'd been there, they'd say, I just came out of there and thought, did I see everything? You know, and that was about the design and that was about the actual flow of the experience um, in there where at the portrait gallery, it's beautiful, it's sort of, you know, you go to gallery one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, um, and people know what they get in those galleries. It's really easy for them to have that experience. So I guess the destination experience can be, the, can be experienced, and I think that's really key. So just with that in mind, Trish, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see your, to hear your thoughts on how much of the marketing that you do for these institutions is on the institution and how much is on the show. Yeah. And I'll just, why I'm asking is yeah. for, for, say, artists here, mm. how much marketing is on me as the artist and how much marketing is on my product, you know, my next, my next mm. exhibition or whatever. Okay, so when I first started working at the museum, it was in 2002. So it was kind of like 12 months old. And I had an incredible marketing budget. Let me tell you, the communications budget was something that you would never see in a cultural institution today. We had a big campaign about the institution, what it was, and who it was. But then we also had an even bigger campaign about the product, so about the exhibition program. I actually think um, in our first 12 months, two years, that that was the wrong thing to do. In hindsight, I can say to you what we should have focused on was actually the product, the actual institution itself, telling people who we are, what we do, um, and the actual experience being less, because we were a new institution. Most of us spent the bulk of our money 
on actually all of the exhibition program, and we have to because we have to promote those programs. We're actually, you know, our KPIs from the government are about this to numbers. So could I say that, you know, you've got to set a target, you've got to achieve those targets. But really for us, at the Portrait Gallery, it's about um, promoting the exhibition program because we want people to come and experience that. And that's the key. Once we get them to, say, an exhibition program, they'll go through the galleries, they'll go to the shop, they'll go to the cafe, they'll exchange with our staff, and it's a whole built experience around that. But every institution now, I think, very much strongly focuses on the actual exhibition, not on the institution. Um, which, you know, that's just the call you've got to make. But I think you can make it work much stronger for you around the exhibition experience rather than the institution, because once you get people in the door, they can actually experience the institution itself and what our values are and what our brand is. So can I? Yeah, no, that's... Yeah, yeah, <coughs> thanks. No worries. So, um, how are we similar to Volvo? I think that uh, that's one of the biggest challenges we've got is that we actually do have to be similar to Volvo. We actually have to keep it really simple. We have to keep it really clear. You know, usually we're not for profit, though I have to say the world is changing in cultural institutions, and I can understand if you people are in business for yourselves how important it is to make money. Cultural institutions haven't always operated in that environment. Um, you know, we're all incredibly well funded by the government when you think about it. Um, and I think although we find that, you know, we've got reducing budgets, you know, we've got efficiency dividends, which nearly kill us every year, but um, I do have to say that we are here not to make profit. That was always our core principle. Um, now, we're here to actually um, be commercially oriented. So, and to focus on the bottom line, you know, we have to generate revenue in ticket sales. We have to get a return on our caterers and our cafe, on our shop. We need to, uh, you know, generate incredible amounts of money for sponsorship. Um, you know, and the government underpins that sort of broader resource that we need. But we no longer can sit in an environment where we don't actually engage in those areas. And I think that's kind of a challenge when you're trying to provide a value experience for the visitor and developing the audience, but that's just the reality of cultural institutions. Could I ask a question just on, on that, because um, I see that as a really important, um, well, a big dilemma, uh, where you get more commercial, you have to take into account more populist tastes to bring in more numerous uh, visitors, yeah. and um, there's a point where artistic integrity and if one thought that may be compromised, and, and the need to to apply pure artistic principles, um, and a cultural institution surely has that responsibility. So yeah. how do you get that balance between what would be uh, broadly appealing to mm. a, a wide group of people, and what is really presenting something cultural uh, in its, in its um, highest form, its most pure form, yeah. in, which may not appeal to all tastes? No, that's right. And look, I have to say that we actually um, sit down and, you know, we would um, look at our exhibition program and our programs. Um, you know, we would be, you know, we would have our exhibition program probably set for the next three years, four years, five years if you're lucky, which is great if you're doing sponsorship. Um, and what we actually try and look at is about having a mixture of those. So, for example, we just had the Go Figure exhibition which was about contemporary Chinese art. Now, we all we knew from the very beginning that that was going to be a hard exhibition to be popular to the general Australian public. But we did it because, you know, it was a really important story that needed to be told and had a really diverse array of artists in that exhibition from China, um, which was part of the early C collection. But we actually try and do a balance of that approach. So, um, for example, you know, next month we open Richard Avedon, which is one of the most famous Australian and American photographers. Incredible, you know, his dedication, the way he took photographs is really about, you know, that artistic rigour. In December, I've got Elvis at 21. 
uh, which is going to be really popular. But so what I'm saying is we really do try and balance that. Then we go to the National Photographic Portrait Prize, which is about engaging artists, uh, young and old, um, you know, in an actual prize, in actually generating them engaging and being able to show it to the broader Australian audiences. So we try and balance it across. We do do things which we know which will be popular and have a broader appeal, but we do do exhibitions at least once or twice a year which are really defined to niche audiences. But that also provides us an opportunity to develop that audience and engage with that audience and, and layer that kind of information and detail um, to different levels of audiences. So, um, you know, you might have people who want to walk through and do the exhibition in half an hour. You might want to have people who want to go back and get a whole lot of research about it. And that's where your website, you know, that academic rigor can sit behind a lot of the exhibitions that we do. <coughs> but it is a challenge, can I say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, uh, in addition to counting the numbers, mm -hmm. how did you go about um, capturing the, I guess, the experience of those who come to the gallery? Yeah. So um, <coughs> we have, so I'll tell you how I count the numbers first. <clears throat> so at the gallery, I count the people who walk in the door. We've got a thermal counter, and we actually track how people actually travel through the institution. So I know that they walk in the front door. Um, I know how many go to the cafe or to the shop, and I know who come through the gallery. And then I know <laughs> if they're going to gallery one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's really important that we actually work out how, what type of experience people have. We've also got kiosks there which we actually get people to fill in. So when people have had the experience, we actually have a series of questions which we ask them. And it's not just about, we do the normal stuff. You know, how old are you? How much money do you earn? You know, what kind of group did you come in? Or are you from interstate? Are you local? But we also talk to them about the type of experience they've had. Um, and that kind of drills down to what type of engagement they wanted to have when they came and did they get that at the end? Um, so if you want to go and have a go on the chaos, um, after you've had experience, it's kind of interesting because it actually does talk about, um, you know, was it, um, I'm just trying to think of a question which I've gone completely blank on now, um, but was it, you know, did we meet your experience? Were you coming here as a tourist? Were you just coming for a look? Was it more intellectual? Um, you know, did you take that out of it? So there is that kind of content rigour around the kiosk. So what then I do is look at the visitor numbers, look at the kiosk, look at what's happening all around Canberra. You know, we've got turmoil next door at the moment. So one of the questions is, who did you visit before you came here or where are you going after here? Um, because we like to know if they've come just to see us. Or oh, we were over the road seeing Turner. We had to park in your car park because it was full of the National Gallery. Um, <clears throat> and we thought we'd just pop in and you know, check you out. Actually, we were really pleasantly surprised about the experience we've had here. So we do a lot of research. And look, you know, when I was at the National Museum, you know, look, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on research. Can I say you can really overcomplicate it? Um, and I just want to put that out there as warning. You know, I've done segmentation research. I've done satisfaction studies. I've done economic impact studies, um, you know, we've done all sorts of things, particularly around the national attraction, because there's all types of different experiences. You know, you've got Coffington Green, you've got, you know, the NGA, and you've got everything in between. Um, and I think that um, research is great and gives you really good understanding. But the thing I find about research is that it actually tells you about who's coming, but nobody actually tells you who's not. Not and I think that's the biggest challenge for us. <clears throat> so our lives are changing. Your lives will probably have to change, though you're probably in much more of a commercial reality than what maybe institutions have been in the past. We have tended to stick our head in the sand and think, let's not be tacky, let's not talk commercial. Um, but I, having been a commercial manager, know how hard it is to shift a cultural organisation to think more commercially. And... Uh, and I don't think it's at the detriment of this stuff. But we do have to think about it now as part of our planning and our strategy. But it also gives us an opportunity about engaging different audiences as well, and I'll get to that shortly. So we have um, well, I've sort of kind of jumped ahead of where we were talking before. 
So promoting the experience to the Tapiro, it's obviously I did a typo there. Um, so we look at, you know, um, how we target or how we used to target was, you know, we're a public education, really, institution, and that's what our base, our viability is built on. Attendance at events and exhibitions, they're really part of what we do. Engagement with the loyal, with the institution, its brand and its loyalty, we, we assess that. And the experience of the destination, and that's what I think is really the key. Those last two are the key to what, we can all count figures, but it's not always about the figures. It's about the type of experience and how they actually engage with the, you know, with your organisations or with your art. Um, that I think is really important. 